those of you of a weak disposition should probably look away now, given the, the topic. The indications for leaving the abdomen open, there are several, and you'll see they fall, as you'll see, into two broad categories. Over the last 20 years, leaving the abdomen open has undoubtedly increased in frequency. And I think there's no doubt it's saved a lot of lives. Um, but it's a pretty big thing to do to somebody. You can see the advantages and the disadvantages there that range from good sepsis drainage down to early enteral nutrition and rapid weaning from the ventilator. But the downsides are self-evident too. You end up with a whacking great wound often that takes a long time to heal. It's deforming, there's psychology associated with it. It doesn't necessarily resolve the sepsis, though it usually does, and the risks of intestinal fistulation and bleeding uh, are occasional and catastrophic sometimes. So what are the indications? Well, I think it's helpful for when you read the literature about this to bear in mind that there are really two groups. There's the short-term one, the 48, 72-hour one for hemorrhage, edema, etc., and there's the longer-term one where abdominal sepsis is usually associated. And the problems are really quite different, and the literature doesn't always discriminate about that. So just bear that in mind. Bear in mind also that the complexity of an open abdomen varies substantially from the one on the top left there, the whole abdomen open with a side extension, as you'll see down there. You just see the wee pointer there where we had a second go at it on ICU with multiple drains and tubes and subsequent enteric fistulation, down to the one here in the top right, which was actually an elective case where we just weren't able to close the fascia, but have left the abdomen open under the skin, as you'll see later. Sometimes there's tubes and drains, sometimes there's stomas, and we'll talk about those a little as we go along. So onto the indications. The first one is the short-term 48, 72-hour uh, or so for acute visceral swelling, most commonly due to hemorrhage, trauma, particularly if you pack the abdomen, that's obviously going to raise the tension as well. And reperfusion uh, after aortic aneurysm is an increasing uh, indication also. And obviously with hemorrhage and fluid shift, you hope it's going to be a short-lived thing and that therefore you can use a short-lived thing, simple and cheap like the Bogota bag that you can see through and see the state of the enteric contents while the patient's in ICU. So the idea here would be that you let the puffiness go down and then you simply close the abdomen in the short term. Falling somewhere in the middle, and slightly awkwardly, of the two nice clean groups I've painted for you is the abdominal compartment syndrome on ICU. And this can either be edema related or sepsis related. So it falls in the middle of our two groups. And abdominal compartment syndrome, intra-abdominal hypertension where the pressure is above 12, or abdominal compartment syndrome proper where it's above 15 with organ dysfunction is not that uncommon and something that's worth bearing in mind when you're called to ICU to see your patients, many of whom, as you see from the list of causes, come from the first group where perhaps the abdomen's been closed over enthusiastically. If we just pull a wee bit harder, we'll get this together, it'll all be fine. Or they have ongoing sepsis and get building edema over the hours after the abdomen's been closed. So usually, but not always, a relatively early phenomenon, and you see it in these circumstances here. The clinical features are secondary to the effect of the raised abdominal pressure, pulmonary compromise, oliguria, mesenteric ischemia, and even, once in a blue moon, raised intracranial pressure. But oliguria will be the usual reason for you being called to ICU. It's easily measured. Uh, this is one way of doing it with a CVP transducer joined to the bladder, uh, joined into the bladder catheter, just through a little side branch there. Uh, Angus MacDonald showed us a very neat way of doing it with a simple water manometer that is presumably cheaper, that again you can do very easily uh, in uh, suspect patients. Uh, if it's a modest degree, you maintain or encourage normal volemia at higher levels, you're going to have to decompress. And again, the decompression in the temporary circumstance, this would be one option. If it involves abdominal sepsis and hence is going to run a longer course, you'd only want to leave a bag on for maybe 48, 72 hours. So if you know at the outset it's going to be longer than that, you're probably better going straight to our fallback, which is the large vicral mesh which you see on the right here, which retains the viscera and reduces the chance of harm probably, as we may 
hear later. The main indication in my practice as a GI surgeon is abdominal sepsis, though. And it's not any old abdominal sepsis. It's usually complex and recurrent abdominal sepsis. Classically, the uh, anastomotic leak or the inadvertent enterotomy. And uh, when deciding to reoperate in those circumstances, here are some of the indications. Leaving the abdomen open is only one part of that. I think that's important to consider that leaving the abdomen open is not an end in itself. It's one bit of a cogent plan for the salvage abdominal sepsis surgery. This is a key operation. The first reoperation is the one that sets the course for the patient. You can deal with the sepsis, you can set them up for a prolonged but otherwise probably relatively uncomplicated recovery, but if this operation is inadequate or ill-judged, you'll end up in serious problems, as obviously will the patient. The aims you see there, you know those, I'm sure, but closing the abdomen if clean and not tense, which occurs uh, not that often, I think it's fair to say. So here are some of the strategies within which you would leave the abdomen open. The ideal for complex abdominal sepsis is obviously to bring the ends out and close the abdomen. Sometimes you can't do that and you bring out a loop enterostomy above, so you defunction the fistulae and you may close some or none of the wound. Sometimes, as we'll see in a moment, you can't get the ends out at all physically and you have to take the air to the fistula so you leave the abdomen widely open and drain it that way. So our open abdomen patients fall in these two groups. Let's have a look at some examples. Here you see the one on the right, on my right, sorry, your left, the proximal loop stoma. This was defunctioning for colorectal sepsis. Here's the proximal loop stoma in the only place we could get it out. I know the abdomen looks closed, but it's actually open under here. There's a couple of corrugated drains going deep into the abdomen there. Uh, on this one, you can see it's self-evident with upper GI. This was duodenal and biliary sepsis. In an immunocompromised patient, you can see the tubes and drains going down to the retroperitoneal duodenal fistula in order to bring the content out together with the abdomen being open. Sometimes late on in the course, you can only really drain the abscess. And here you see somebody who's had a midline laparotomy. This was complex Crohn's disease and then blew up and got further problems after PERC drainage and reoperation elsewhere, etc. And all that could be done was to open the abdomen over the pus and over the feces and lay it open, except there would be fistulation. And he healed okay over a prolonged period of time. But the more common situation is this one, isn't it? Post-op, day 12, something's gone wrong, and here we are fiddling around with a wound. And you can see the state of the tissues here. Reclosing these with ever bigger bites of number one proline is probably not going to work. It's going to cut through, it's going to be tight, and this is the circumstance. And what you've got to ask yourself as you've dealt with the leak, brought the ends out, etc., is where you want to be another week down the line. Do you want to be here? with the open abdomen, the sepsis receding, the stoma at the side, or do you want to be here with everything rotting, the stoma's fallen in, etc., etc. Further problems which are all too often unmanageable, even with the best will in the world. So leaving the abdomen open in that circumstance, I guess I've learned the hard way to try and close the ends at each end because that just limits the tension. Some people, you leave the abdomen open widely and you gaze on in horror over the next 72 hours in ICU as the abdomen opens more and more and more and you end up with this huge defect that again is unmanageable. So closing each end in a modest mesh, not under undue tension. But the emphasis, of course, is that it's an absorbable, usually vicral mesh, and uh, because you don't want to be putting a non-absorbable thing in there, that would be a catastrophe. Sometimes doing this, you need to bring a stoma out, and this is a point worth making. I often get asked, how do you do this? You, you can just see down here, we've just tacked the stoma to the edge of the laparostomy, and uh, that will sit there. The enteric content, I can't remember anybody that's had problems intra-abdominally. I usually leave a big drain just on the other side of the stoma to try and minimize that, but that will all uh, heal down and scar down, as you'll see in a moment. The other circumstance that you can sometimes do is to bring the stoma out through the fascial defect, but tunnel it under the skin. And that way you can get a bag right around it, and that obviously makes gathering enteric content easily. We stick a big bag over the top, that keeps it clean and moist and limits damage, and you can do that 
here's a duodenal fistula controlled with a tube. A great big bag over the top. You can leave that for 72 hours. And these big bags, in more complex circumstances, uh, where you've got tubes and catheters, you get ones that have a port in them so you can fiddle around and wash the wound out, move the catheters around. And they have suction ports, so if you want, you can aspirate the enteric content through these side ports. So these are very useful, and they come in a large enough size to cope with even the biggest wig and abdomen that's been fed liberally with pies. So you get enormous ones, uh, and you get medium-sized ones, but you just need to know where they come from and keep one or two in your theatre shelf. The next indication, if you like, again, sepsis-related, is unresolved peritoneal contamination, where you think you're going to have to go back. Relatively uncommon, it must be said, occasional fecal peritonitis, uh, occasional pancreatic necrosis would be the two uh, most likely. And in that circumstance, you might want to use a sandwich dressing. You see one here. Here's a cross-section through the abdominal wall with the bowel loops and the open abdomen here. We would use this initially. Maybe the laparostomy is a bit oozy and you want a bit more than a bag on it, or else you know you're going to wash it out in theatre again the next day, which we do occasionally. And the way you do that is put upside, sticky side up so it's not sticking to the bowel, some moist gauze rolls, a drain or two to gather the enteric or edematous content, some post-op pads on top, and a big upside, sticky side down holding it all in. And that's easy to do. You can change it on the ICU if you want. The next indication is when you're unable to exteriorize. So going back to the right hand most of our little schema of operative diagrams, and here you see an open loop of jejunum stuck in a mat of granulation tissue. You're going to shred that trying to get it to the surface, so you can't do that. And we reopened the midline in this patient and extended the incision right down to the left flank. So this, which is in the left paracolic gutter, was sitting right under the skin wound. So it was easiest for the enteric content to come out. Here you see the case here. Had a colectomy, splenectomy got an abscess in the left upper quadrant, pert drain, didn't sort the sepsis, had a GI bleed of unknown cause, gastroscopy was negative, presumably from the fistula, and we were unable to get down to exteriorize it. He also had a large psoas abscess, so we opened the abdomen right down into the flank over the fistula, put great big drains in the psoas abscess and in the rectal stump, and left the abdomen open. And as was always the case, eight weeks down the line with the sepsis controlled and the patient artificially fed, the laparostomy shrinks magnificently. This was round in shape at the time, and you can see how it's contracted down. The fistula was just under there. He had two great big drains in there that, again, is healing up. So the final uh, acute indication, if you like, is loss of abdominal wall, necrotizing fasciitis. What are you going to do in the acute situation? The big vicral mesh works very well. So the open abdomen in the acute situation can be life-saving, rapid and simple. It has to be part of an overall plan. It's not an end in itself. It's not a first-line procedure. It will cause complications. There's a major ongoing surgical commitment to contribute to the wound management in ICU. It doesn't end all the problems, and as you'll hear later in the symposium, reconstruction's complex. But here you see one that's healed down on its own over a period of time. You see how it's scarred in and the fistula has matured in the midline on its own. Occasionally we do it uh, in elective operations. This individual had a previous open abdomen and it was felt better just to leave a little open vicral mesh there than do a complex plastic surgery flap, which we sometimes do in this elderly and frail patient. And sometimes, as I showed you earlier, you have a fascial defect but you can actually close the skin over it if uh, the skin is loose enough. And that's obviously better to have it covered. It keeps it warm and moist, but don't overdo the skin tension. Otherwise, you risk necrosis again. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, two broad indications for leaving the abdomen open. There's the short-term acute visceral edema group, and there's the abdominal sepsis group, where the time course is inevitably longer and there are greater problems and the abdominal compartment syndrome sits in the middle with a foot in each camp. Thank you very much.